get started. Man. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're gonna get started with the next uh, session just because we're running really, really late. I'm just gonna talk for two minutes really quickly uh, about camera. Camera is really, I think, Penn's response to the same questions that came up in the last section about institutionalizing multi multimodality. Uh, I put up our mission right here. I'm not gonna read through it, but really what we are is multimodal researchers. We wanna take that seriously. We wanna think with multimodality. We wanna make in sound, film, image, uh, digital installations perhaps in the future, and we wanna teach about this stuff. Um, our showcase event is the Screening Scholarship Media Festival, which is coming up next week. It's kind of the next part of this. If this is about theorizing about these things, that's about making, really, and digital making. So I think our theme this year is performing the digital. Everybody coming all over the states and the world will be presenting on this. We have a great filmmaker, uh, Renan Alexandrovich, who, who made the film The Law in These Parts. Sundance, Sundance Jury Prize, just a brilliant film. And I guess what I'll say, passing it off to these guys, is over the three years, we really thought, man, we want to legitimize film, we want to legitimize multimodality, and kind of we've been able to do that in some ways, but it's become a little bit insular. And the problem, I think, is not amongst us here. We all kind of have the same language that we're sharing. It's talking across those who don't already have that language and really teaching. So it's a pedagogic thing that we're undertaking now. And what's kind of happened really in a funny and great way is that we've, been, we've come on in a lot of ways as consultants for projects where people have said, like, really, we want a filmmaker to come and help us think about research and film together. Or we want to create a digital installation or uh, a museum space where we're using film and photography. How do we do that? And us as graduate students have come in and been able to say, OK, well, here's how we think about doing it. Let's add it to uh, your portfolio as well. Uh, we sometimes get paid for that. that adds in a whole nother le level of graduate labor questions, and I won't talk about that right now. But the other thing that came up is these kind of short workshops um, where a camera really thinks about how professors who don't really have any language to think about this stuff or any of the tools to think about this stuff can get that in 30 minutes or an hour or in a day-long workshop. So this is one of our showcase workshops, and I'll just let Gabriel and Sophia take it from here. So that was Arjun, and he's the uh, co-director of Camera. And just uh, just uh, to reiterate, Camera is a mainly graduate student-run uh, organization. It has graduate students participating from across the university. We have religious studies folks. We have anthropology folks. We have education folks. Uh, we have communication folks. So it's been a really rich space for all of us to really think about what we're trying to do when we when we do research, and who we're trying to reach when we do research, and how we can make research, right? Um, so as Arjun also said, one of the things we've been doing um, are running these small and sometimes longer provocations, right? So workshops that get people to think about uh, the ways they see when they go into spaces and do qualitative work. Um, so what is this engagement with, with the world? and ourselves, right, in, 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 um, in, uh, in this kind of connection that we make with the world as we see, as we listen, as we uh, feel. So um, Sophia is going to um, open up the conversations. I'm going to run around with the microphone. This is really about you guys talking. So we're going to ask some questions. We're going to show some of the products that you all made. And hopefully that'll push us along to think together a little bit before it's time for the next panel or coffee, actually, before it's time for coffee. Thanks. Great. Um, so this workshop is really about thinking about the ways that when we deploy different modalities to both produce and represent ethnographies or to capture different phenomena in social life, so what happens when we do that? Um, so for those of you that weren't here earlier, these were the instructions. We asked people to go out in pairs to find something interesting out there. Um, and to capture it. And the only instructions we gave are that one person has to capture it in text, and the other one has to capture it in a non-textual format. Um, and then to send their pieces to me. And so we're gonna start with our first example. We have Roxanne and Amy. And this is what they captured in text. So take a minute to read through it. And 
and this was their non-textual representation. Yeah, maybe the blinds. So here we have those, the text and the photograph together. And sort of our first question is just simply, what do you see? What does the text and the picture evoke separately and together? And what do they evoke differently? So if you raise your hand, I'll bring a microphone to you. <laughs> so, yeah, I see a contradiction here. There's a, a complex set of uh, intricate impossibilities between, you know, growth, strength, and buds, and then this picture of bleakness. Thank you very much. I think in some ways it's interesting because we have to know that, you know, it's, it's near the end of March and there's all this context to when this picture was taken that make us so that we can interpret, you know, spring uh, strength, growth, and buds. Um, whereas if it was taken, you know, earlier in the winter, then. I just love those single syllables and the punctuation. Boom, 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 boom. There's a marked sense of lack of people and persons. Like, even the text somehow doesn't communicate to me like it's talking about human bodies in any way. It only seems to be the relationship of space to space, so to say. I don't know. Do I make any sense? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to echo to what the first comment said, that you can't see any buds in the, or growth in the picture. And when I read the, the text, I walked here today, and I, was, I saw a bunch of crocuses in the, in the snow. And so when I read that text, my context was, was expecting to see somebody went out and took a picture of like the crocuses growing up through the snow. So when I saw that picture, I, I wasn't expecting that. So it's interesting, I just wanna point out some of the things that I heard that people said. So initially, Jesse's first comment, like it's a lie. Maybe it comes from looking, thinking about just the text, Right, and then maybe the picture or the thoughts that it evoked for him versus this picture, right? And how that maybe created a dissonance or maybe based on his experience of today and not wanting any more cold weather, right? And uh, this gentleman over here also pointed out that you have to know that it's March and maybe people want to expect more spring-like weather and we, so we get more snow. Um, but I also heard people say something about the text evoking something in particular, right? So perhaps in the ways that we write, we can evoke certain things. Um, and in the ways that we choose to take a picture, we can evoke maybe different things, right? So the ways that text can evoke pictures in our heads that pictures don't do that because they have that there, right? Anyone else might want to add something to what we've seen so far? Okay. Did that stir anything? I think just following on from this conversation, I think there's a sense of difference in proximity and scale that comes through in that word image difference. And um, it really makes you aware of the question of framing and uh, the selection of the perspective and the ability of, you know, in a single photograph, you choose a frame, but with the words, you can choose to kind of move in, in and out. And so it'd be interesting also to, you know, there was a video as well to put up here and think about how that would extend the conversation. Great, and I think with that, thought about framing and zooming in and out, we can go into the next um, uh, group. And we have the text here. So um, I don't know if my Annalise is here. Is she here? Yeah, I see that um, it looks like my eyes are 
you can tell. Um, and at least you want to read it. If you'd so like to read it out loud for us. Yeah. Oh, oh, purgatory. <laughs> So I'll move on to the non-textual representation. Here we have both together. And for this example, um, and Maisha and Annalise are here. I'm not sure if they're, okay. Um, I want to ask both of you sort of um, what going into this exercise, um, what was the experience of going into it with one person having this charge of doing it textually and the other person non-textually? Well, originally the challenge was finding something that we both agreed caught our eye, so we, we thought is it something that catches our eye collectively or individually? Because that's sometimes the problem, right? It's where we have different you know, experience and we're looking at different things differently. So I think we try to collaborate and agree on what um, was interesting and try to figure out why we thought it was interesting. Um, so I think that was the challenge because we spent you know, a, quite a bit of time looking for something uh, that we, that we wanted to, uh, to capture. And then when we found this object, um, I don't even think I read the, the text panel. Annalise, did you read it? I, I don't even know the history of the object or anything. I was really trying to study it to see, um, you know, what, to explain, like, why is this interesting? So that's part of the, the challenge is, um, is explaining why you think you, why something uh, yeah. is captivating, um, and you were the one who drew the picture. Yes. So how did you? So you you were thinking about what was captivating about this as you were drawing, or no? No, I think it was more of the the first step was to find the object, oh. to examine the object. Um, and agree, like, is this, you know, is this interesting? And then, like, the next step, we actually, at that point, we both executed uh, at the same time. Like, I was drawing while, while Annalise was writing. So, um, it was very much collaborative, but very much individual. Like, we were working on our, our, you know, our project separately after we discussed, like, um, discussed and agreed, like, this is what we wanted to do. what you might have been thinking about when you said that, so. That's. And also for those of you who participated, um, whose work might not be up here, um, and for example, the example I just showed, um, if maybe you can talk about how you approached sort of the task as well, for those of you who also, I know there was a group here who was also working on something. Okay, um, we both needed a partner, mm -hmm. and she said, can you sing? And I said, yeah, in church. <laughs> and so um, she did the text, and then I wrote a song. And so it came, that's how our collaboration came. You might want to share more. And it was a process, not a thing, since that was a choice. So it emerged from a conversation we had about our teaching over lunch. 
Great, so it became sort of representing this process that of the conversation. Any others? Okay. Yeah, let's go into the third um, pair. So Ruth and Peter uh, took up this challenge as well. And we have a video, right? And right here. Here, Here. Okay. We need some editing, though. You can do it. Flashes of light, quick lightning bolts on my right side, the periphery. I try not to look so I won't see them, but they come back one after another. I keep driving, trailed by those streaks. Eye flashes, they're called, I will learn later. Lines cutting the sky. Next day I find an ophthalmologist. And just to clarify, this is sort of the text was represented in the video. Ruth and Peter. Okay. So we have another sort of um, take up of this exercise, right? And something that uh, is visual and it's moving images. So what did you guys see in the video? What kind of um, what kind of sense did you get of that space that they captured, or that moment, or that? I felt like what it was shown to be in sort of a protected space. I thought it was interesting that she was talking about something that sounded kind of threatening and she was halfway between like threatening no and she was yes, she was like shocking and she had it it created a you know, a different kind of feeling to me for her to be shielded by that threat. Just to riff on that, I, I thought um, that there was something about the contextualization of what Ruth said in the morning, right? So all of a sudden now we have a snowfall um, in a 19th century building um, scene, right? We have a close-up of, um, of Ruth's face and we have the paper kind of on the periphery and her glasses, yeah. And I, I mean, I thought, you know, having that kind of contextualization into a sensuous space um, change the words, right? Or change the meaning, at least for me, of what was, what was being said. It, it placed it in a, in a temporal chain, an essential world, right? Um, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed that. I think like when you see a text or when you kind of even see words on a page, hear them, they're kind of, I mean, they can be active as well, but there's something kind of static and finished. Like there's been, it's been polished, it's the words were chosen, the text is what it is. Um, but something about, I think her, you know, her, her facial expression, the camera was kind of moving around. There was something active and unfinished about it. Like it was, she was almost kind of reinterpreting the text or, there was room for kind of a lot of motion um, and vitality, both in terms of meaning and then I think in terms of what was gonna happen next that made it, gave it kind of a different energy. Yeah, time for one more comment. Or... I was just gonna 
was just going to ask, sort of pose a different, uh, another question to the audience. So taking some of these comments together, both about sort of um, Annalise's point about thinking about the relationship between who's taking that video and what kind of lens, is it an empathetic lens, how close or how far, or questions about framing or questions about how you evoke in text. How can we connect that to the, both the practice of doing ethnography and also the ways in which it is represented in its ultimate form? I'm not really sure I can speak entirely to that, but I think um, one of the things that was striking about the video to me was that it, it and, and sort of along the lines of this empathy idea, was that it was, um, it felt very personal to me, like the kind of, like looking from Peter's perspective, like as the filmmaker, the kind of film you make of someone who's close to you and you guys are hanging out and you know, it's very, it's sort of messy and it's like something you keep on your phone for you, right? Whereas as an archaeologist, the, the sketch of the of the um, <clears throat> the piece of pottery was very familiar to me in a very different sort of way, right? Where that to me is a is a even though it was beautifully constructed and obviously you know it's it has a distance to it um, that that the the sort of movement of the film doesn't. Um, and then the photograph is one where it's it's sort of ambiguous, right? I think without the text, it, it maybe could have been personal in some way, right? But then that disconnect that we've already talked about between the text and the and the photograph created a sort of different relationship to it. So I don't know, that's sort of how I was taking it in. Uh, just an observation on the tricksters here, because uh, your instruction said, do something that catches your eye. And I don't know if you did that on purpose, Peter and Ruth, but mm -hmm. there's a trickster element to this piece that you did something that captured the eye that is about the eye getting captured uh, and hanging on for dear life. And, you know, those were the instructions. So, okay, unconscious uh, sort of meta levels of uh, the eye of the eye, etc. The other thing that I, I don't know if I got this right or not, but I felt a little tricked because during our panel and I was sitting up there next to you before it was your turn, I saw you with printed text, uh, with typed text. And so did you rewrite that for your staging, restaging of the eye for Peter? You hand wrote, yeah. You were doing, yeah. So, so we were tricked just now to think that you were reenacting the same text, but it was a handwritten, yeah, I thought I saw that. So anyway, just a couple observations on the <laughs> rascals amongst us. Um, so I had a question. Can we hear the song? He may be an engineering student who whispers so you barely hear. He may be someone who struggles for fear of what you may see. But when he is with the children, he sprouts wings and starts to fly. We start to see an angel just because he can see the sky.
Thank you. So um, as Gabriel said, this is sort of just a provocation and an exercise we like to do to think about what the affordances of different types of modalities, both in the engagement with the field and in the ways that they're represented. Um, so hopefully this was a fruitful exercise, Paula. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. That was great. Um, so we have coffee break now until 3.30. So, um, and they've replenished the cookies. <laughs> Leave the camera stuff. Yeah.